Uh, Margarita Sani worked at the Institute of uh, Cultural Heritage of the region Emilia Romagna, where she is in charge of international projects in the museum field. In the last 20 years, she has designed and managed several EU funded projects, in particular on museum education, lifelong learning, and intercultural dialogue. She is an active member of many uh, professional museum associations and networks, among which are NIMO, ICOM, European Museum Academy. She has been an uh, uh, executive board uh, member of NEMO Network of European Museum Organization and since 2014 uh, she has been on the jury of the Children of Museum Awards and since 2019 on the steering committee of Europeana Education. So I will give the floor directly to Margarita uh, and um, I'm really thankful that she is with us and she will lead this uh, webinar and uh, later the training for uh, during three days. Thank you very much for this and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lana. And it's a real honor and pleasure for me to be here uh, with you today. I have uh, very fond memories of my time in Belize when I came to deliver a, a a workshop on museum education, but it's good that we have this possibility of being together also um, while being physically separated. So uh, today we're looking at this topic of working internationally for museums, especially in the framework of EU funded uh, programs. Uh, let me start with, um, Okay, I'll minimize myself. So I don't see anyone now, I just see my screen. So if there's anything, just switch on the microphone and tell me because now I am a sort in, in a vacuum. Um, I would just like to start by uh, mentioning uh, the legal basis of all that the EU is doing. Uh, this is just a bit of uh, background information to, to know in which context we are operating. And also because all EU calls uh, programs always refer to these uh, legal bases, uh, which are basically the treaties, the European treaties that the, the countries adhering to the European Union uh, signed. And um, there are two main uh, treaties, uh, the Treaty on the European Union and the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union. In these treaties, um, the, um, of course, cultural heritage is, is mentioned and it is also defined as including natural built and archaeological sites, museums, monuments, artworks, historic cities, literary, musical and audiovisual works, and the knowledge, practices and traditions of European citizens, so also intangible heritage. And it is important to bear in mind that uh, those who are responsible for cultural heritage and for museums, of course, are the member states. So the European Union is intervening only in a way uh, to support uh, and, and, uh, and to uh, give measures that um, support uh, the, the policies that are in any case uh, in the remit of member states. So this is where the uh, EU funded uh, programs come about, right? Um, the Treaty of Maastricht uh, dated 1992, which established the, the, the single uh, internal market, the European internal market, uh, also uh, mentions uh, culture and the diversity of, of culture uh, and the linguistic diversity as well. Um, of course, uh, there is uh, this uh, phrase saying that the European Union preserves uh, unity within diversity or unity in diversity. That is the sort of like interplay between being one European Union but having very different member states uh, with their traditions, with their heritage, uh, with their way of working and living. So uh, European um, cultural and linguistic diversity is uh, respected and is safeguarded and enhanced thanks to the intervention of the European Union. Um, and again, I'm just, you know, uh, I've just taken out some, some sentences out of these treaties to reinforce this concept of respecting national and regional diversity 
and at the same time bringing the common cultural heritage to the fore. So there is this idea of having a common cultural heritage, which however is um, taking many different forms at national and regional level. So the union is encouraging cooperation and is supporting and supplementing the actions of the states in the following areas. Improvement of knowledge and dissemination of cultural and history of the European peoples, conservation and safeguarding of cultural heritage of European significance, non-commercial cultural exchanges, artistic and literary creation, including in the audiovisual sector. So again, it is a sort of like subsidiarity. The concept of subsidiarity is what the uh, European is about, the European Union is about when coming to the cultural heritage sector. Just a very, very quick look, not to confuse you, but just to hopefully clarify the different players at European level. I'm not going into detail and you're going to have this uh, PowerPoint later on and can go back to it. So there's, as you know, the European Parliament, which is the legislative arm of the EU uh, with 705 members of European parliaments that are directly uh, elected by the people. Within this European Parliament, this is a bit more relevant for us, there are committees and there's also a committee uh, for culture and education. And this is the, um, the chair of, of, this, uh, of this committee, Sabine Verheyen uh, from, from Germany. Uh, committees, of course, and in particular the, the Committee on Cultural and Education, proposes legislation, uh, prepare reports, and, and, and so this, this committee is central. This is what we relate to when, when uh, dealing with European uh, Parliament representatives. Uh, then we have the European Council, chaired by uh, this uh, Belgian um, uh, politician, Michel, and this is the, um, the uh, organization, not the organization, but the organism which defines the EU general political direction and priorities. And the European Council uh, comprises all the heads of states and government. So the prime minister or the presidents, depending on whether we're talking about presidential or uh, parliamentary uh, states. Uh, the Council of the European Union on the other side, so we had the European Council, this is where it gets confusing, but you will not be confused. And Scene, right? The Council of the European Union, on the other hand, is uh, composed of 27 ministers of state uh, who meet to discuss and set policy in the different areas, for example, culture. So this uh, Council of the European Union uh, is just one single legal entity, but it meets in 10 different configurations. So one of these configurations is culture and education. In other words, the, um, the ministers of culture, when they meet in Brussels, they come together as part of this Council of the European Union, which meets especially to deal with uh, cultural issues. Uh, these uh, sessions are chaired by the Minister of the Member State, which is holding the six-month um, presidency of the EU. Uh, again, as I said, there are these 10 configurations. One is education, youth, culture, and sport. And one important um, body or uh, entity preparing all these meetings of the ministers of culture is the Cultural Affairs Committee. Uh, this is made of uh, officers coming from the different member states, normally coming from the ministries also. They prepare the work of the ministers when they come together within the framework of the Council of the EU. And they meet six to eight times per semester. As I mentioned, uh, these sessions are uh, chaired by the, uh, by the state, who, um, which is currently holding the presidency of the EU. As you know, there is a rotation of, of uh, presidency every six months. Uh, we are currently under the um, uh, chairmanship, let's say, of Slovenia until the end of the year. And countries work in a sort of like um, in partnership in what is called a trio presidency. So they, they, they um, 
former um, state member state that held the, the presidency, the, the, the present and the future, so that uh, policies are coherent and, and have a leading thread throughout this period of 18 months altogether. So not to be confused, we have, we mentioned the European Council, uh, which is uh, made up of the heads of state or government. Uh, we have the Council of the European Union, which on the other hand is made up of ministers, uh, in our case, ministers of culture in, uh, in this specific configuration. And then I just wanted to mention the Council of Europe, because Council of Europe is a completely different uh, entity and organization. It is an intergovernmental organization which aims to protect human rights, democracy and the rule of law, which was set up in 1949, especially to deal with uh, conventions on human rights. And, uh, and it is a much larger organization in terms of international organization, in terms of membership, because it represents 47 member states. And um, so let's, well, the Council of Europe, for instance, to give you a reference, is the organization that uh, uh, produced and, uh, and launched the Faro Convention on the value of cultural heritage for society, the 2005 Faro Convention, which is so important to establish some concepts of like you know, the uh, heritage communities, the involvement of citizens in taking care of cultural heritage and all this. So that is uh, something that was started and that is still continued by the Council of Europe. So um, to just put, uh, say, uh, faces to names or names to faces, this is the European Commission. Uh, when we say European Commission, we can mean uh, this, this group of ministers, each minister has been appointed by one of the member states, uh, with of course the, the chair, uh, the president, Ursula von der Leyen, and they are the executive arm of the EU, proposed laws, policy agreements, they are the um, sort of like the, the, the ministers at European level, the ministers that um, that uh, govern uh, the European um, policies. There are also advisory bodies to this commission. Uh, they are the Committee of the Regions and the European Economic and Social Committee. But when we say European Commission, we might also mean the office. So the, the uh, officers, the so-called Eurocrats, bureaucrats or Eurocrats who work in Brussels, in the office of, of the European Commission. So on the one hand, this is maybe uh, a bit uh, um, misleading the term when we use European Commission. We can mean the, uh, the commissioners, so the uh, politicians appointed by member states, but much more often we mean the officers and the office which, uh, for instance, produce uh, white box, uh, policy uh, documents, recommendations, they are, and this is why I, I put up this uh, photograph of Madhu, this is uh, the, the, the building there is, is where most of these uh, officers have their office in Brussels. So this is also uh, indicated as European Commission. The commissioner, so the person responsible for culture, is currently uh, this lady, Maria Gabriel. And uh, this is an interesting story when she came to, uh, to be nominated um, a couple of years ago when the elections took place. Um, she, uh, she was simply named Commissioner for Innovation and, and Youth. And then there was an upheaval in the culture uh, world because, of course, the word culture did not appear uh, in, in her, uh, say, uh, remit and, and in the label of, of her position. So there was a lot of fuss and a lot of uh, criticism uh, coming to, in the end, to have the name of, uh, of the commissioner or the, the label of the commissioner changed 
to again innovation research cultural education and youth and and this is a tweet by uh, Europa Nostra a very active uh, um, organization at European level, uh, the level of European uh, policies, and uh, a tweet by Europa Nostra applauding to, uh, to President von der Leyen to have indeed restored the title of Maria Gabriel to include culture in it, which is very important, because if culture disappears, even in the name of the commissioner, then it means that culture is not so relevant, right? Culture is very relevant for what the European Union wants to achieve. And I'm just, I thought I would just mention this if you want to go back to, to some uh, readings uh, of, an of a recent interview of Maria Gabriel given to the Charter Project, which is also a European funded project, which I will mention later in this conversation. Uh, there is an interview uh, given by Maria Gabriel that you can that you can read, and it's specifically about skills and competencies and professions in cultural heritage in uh, in Europe. So let's come to the topic. Let's get more. So that was a sort of like background information, right? But we come to what is really relevant for us today, which is how to work, how to operate internationally within the framework of the European uh, programs. Uh, and of course, I'm referring uh, to, to this handbook, which I produced uh, last year. Actually, it was published at the beginning of 2021, uh, but I worked on it mostly uh, in 2020, uh, thanks to, to Nemo, who was the initiator of this, uh, of this and the instigator of this publication. Having uh, considered and having um, realized that through its uh, 2019 research on EU funding for museums, galleries and archives in Europe, that not enough museums are involved in European funded initiatives. So um, this report, which is also available on the NEMO website, um, shows, well, it is a, a, an in-depth research on EU funding uh, to highlight and to, to pull out uh, the engagement of, of museums, uh, how much do museums uh, take advantage of European funding, not only of, of the funding itself, but also of the possibility of sharing and developing something with colleagues from other countries, with museums from different countries. So having in the end established that not enough museums, uh, and if in addition, not enough, and very much the same actors, the same museums take advantage of EU funding, um, Nemo asked me to produce this publication that would uh, encourage um, museums to operate at uh, international level, uh, not necessarily uh, European level, in general, cross-border cooperation, so establishing contacts and collaborations with organizations in, in different countries, in other countries. But of course, there is a lot that is referred to European programs in this publication. So just Looking briefly at the table of contents, you've had, I know that thanks to the B Museum project and thanks to the Georgian Museum Association, this publication has been translated into Georgian. So that is very good and very helpful, I'm sure. Of course, I'm using the, the, uh, the English uh, version and the English text. So in the table of contents, you will find these chapters. And the main, uh, say, chapter uh, to which I will refer this morning is this number two, uh, chapter two, getting started, which uh, identifies these uh, different steps to get into, say, uh, European and international cross-border cooperation. First of all, uh, the organizational check. Uh, it is very important uh, when you consider whether you want to um, be involved in, the, in an international cooperation project to do a self-evaluation check of your organization or to at least to have an internal uh, check 
to look at yourself as an organization to establish whether you have an international strategy. I mean, have you considered to move in the international field already? Do you have something in your mission that states what your objectives are? And if you have uh, a mission, a mission statement, if you have a vision, a mission statement, do these objectives that are contained in the mission statement, do they match the EU funding priorities? And here we come to a crucial element. Uh, and, and of course, we will elaborate on this a little bit more this morning, but much more in the afternoon today and tomorrow with, with the colleagues that are taking part in the workshop, because this is essential. Uh, it is not enough to have uh, priorities in your organization, uh, but it is priorities that also have, say, uh, an international um, outlook, uh, an international interest, uh, but it is important that these priorities uh, match, uh, are in line with the priorities of the EU and especially of the EU funding programs, right? Look at your organization and, and look at the needs you have. Um, needs of maybe capacity building, needs of uh, researching a specific topic, needs of um, trying out new business models, different ways of doing things. Now, could these needs be addressed through international cooperation? Or is it better to look more closely at um, um, local funding or national funding? Maybe they could be met, these needs, locally. Uh, maybe they don't have this European added value. Again, this is a term that we will go back to this morning and today and tomorrow uh, and Saturday, of course. Um, the European added value. It is important when thinking uh, internationally that uh, um, that what you think of has uh, uh, a, a European interest, an international interest. Um, have the costs and benefits of investing time and resources in international work been evaluated? Because it does take time, it takes knowledge, expertise uh, to, um, to work internationally, and first of all, to prepare an international uh, application. Um, so are there staff assigned to these activities? Is this staff trained? Do they have experience? And if not, is it possible to liaise with an organization, maybe in your area, that is more experienced and that is willing to share that expertise? It's very important as ever to talk with peer organizations and, and find out also how did they like it to work internationally? Was it uh, easy? Was it difficult? What did it take? What are the tips that they can give you? So again, that starts a sort of a, 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 an exchange, a conversation with other players, with other organizations. And that is very important because the next important building block is building a network. So having a network of uh, partners, uh, a network of other organizations to exchange ideas with, uh, it is absolutely essential. And this is essential in particular when you are developing a concept, when you are developing a project idea, because uh, you cannot be alone. I've seen examples of European funded projects that were conceived and developed, you know, the, 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 the plan, the design uh, of, the, of the project was, um, was developed by just one organization, the coordinator, so the organization that then applied for funding. Uh, and they just, you know, the, the other partners just were just added up. Um, that when it came to carrying out the project, it didn't really work because uh, that was the idea of one organization and not of all the others. The idea, the concept needs to be shared and, uh, and therefore um, uh, it is important to, to, to start 
creating this exchange at the very early stage of, of planning a European uh, project or an international project. It is also very important because um, say you are the initiator of, uh, of an idea. You are the one uh, who is putting on the table an idea for a project starting from your needs, starting from you know your considerations etc um, it is important to uh, compare these ideas and these needs with the ideas of others and if you're thinking internationally especially with the ideas of other uh, organizations in different countries and this is where the importance of networking uh, comes in and the importance of being part of an international network so in this sense being part of first of all the georgian museum association which is already a network organization which brings together museums in georgia and then uh, being partner through them also of nemo so of an international uh, network that surely uh, puts you in contact with, um, with other um, similar organizations to yours. And there you start exchanging, seeing what is relevant, what are the topics that are discussed, uh, what are the solutions. And, and little by little, you, you, you develop maybe the conviction that yes, it is possible to, uh, to, to develop a project with these partners, a project that is profitable and beneficial to all of you, not just to one organization. So here we come to the core uh, of developing a project and, and the project idea. Um, the first question is, uh, is this project idea in line with uh, the mission and the objectives of my organization? Because if it is not, it's going to be very tough. Um, so, it is important to start from the needs and ideas and priorities of your organization, because uh, if you develop something that is totally out of scope, then it will be useless. And not only useless, but it will uh, draw energies uh, from your organization, your staff, uh, yourselves will have to work on something that you don't see as relevant and that is very frustrating. That is frustrating and that is negative. So possibly in the end, eventually, no further uh, international cooperation will be followed up because uh, this, uh, uh, this project proved to be uh, very useless, time consuming, demanding, because cooperation projects are time consuming, demanding, ambitious. We will see, uh, you know, uh, also in the toolkit, you find, um, you find comments and remarks by people uh, having participated in European uh, funded projects. Also uh, the remarks that were shared um, by the Georgian Museum Association considering regarding their participation in B Museum. Uh, there are benefits, enormous benefits, but there is also a lot that needs to be invested. So it is important that what you get in the end is relevant for your organization. Uh, and it is important that it stems from a, a, an analysis of needs and an analysis of the context. And this uh, also needs to be done in writing uh, because uh, this is one of the questions, right? That you will be asked in the application form. And we will see it with your colleagues or with the colleagues participating this afternoon. One of the questions, what are the needs? Where does this project stem from? Because it cannot just be, oh, a nice idea. It has to be documented. You need to give evidence that this is something that has roots that really addresses a need, a necessity of uh, the organizations uh, involved and also can benefit other organizations that are not involved. So it also has a wider, um, uh, say, um, effect. Um, of course, the project idea needs to resonate with the interests and priorities of peer organizations in other countries. As I was saying before, it cannot just be a one 
men or one organization idea, it needs to ring a bell or to light uh, on a light, to switch on a light bulb also in, in, other, uh, in other partners, uh, in, in, in other countries, right? So again, the idea of networking, also of exchanging long before, maybe even long before um, the, the, the call for, uh, for proposals comes out uh, is, is important. This is a long-term project that of developing these partnerships. Uh, of course, the project idea needs to be in line with the priorities of the funding program. This is an absolute must. And, and uh, again, this is part of, this is one of the key questions that are asked in the application. Uh, show how your priorities match the priorities, the scope, uh, the objectives of the, of the funding program. So of the call that has been issued by the directorate, whatever it is that funds the, uh, the project. Uh, it has to have an international value, so it has to be shown that, uh, you know, it is not only a good idea that could be funded locally uh, or that has uh, an, an effect, an outcome that, that uh, um, of local importance. It needs to be international, it needs to be, in this case, European. So again, the question of the European added value is going to be asked. And it needs to be sustainable after the completion of the project. So this is a very crucial issue, right? Everyone, every one of us, when we finish, a, not only when we finish a project, also when we uh, fill in an application, have to uh, give ideas of how this project, uh, well, not the project, the project cannot continue after the, the end of the funding, so after the end of the project itself. But some of its components, can continue. Uh, so the idea of sustainability, which is the idea of money is not being wasted for something that is done and full stop. No. And, and so just to give you an example, how are uh, the ways to, 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 to uh, uh, say guarantee sustainability can be, for instance, that you produce uh, within the project, you produce a website, uh, or a platform that continues to be um, maintained and implemented over the years by one of the partner organizations or by uh, the coordinator, or that you develop um, maybe training courses that partner uh, organizations uh, are willing to continue to deliver because it is in their remit uh, to, to, to deliver training, or again, maybe you develop a business model of a way of doing things that is going to be continued over time. So these are the things that, you know, uh, will convince the evaluators or the assessors uh, that, uh, that the project is worth uh, being funded and that the project did well because it also left something behind and something behind not only for the uh, for the uh, organizations that were directly involved in the project but also for others who could not uh, take part in the in the partnership in the consortium so this is uh, <clears throat> this is a picture i often use to show uh, what it is like to be in a European uh, project, uh, that it is, uh, but you have to keep a balance. You have to balance between uh, the priorities uh, of your organization and the priorities of the uh, funding program. So the priorities of the call that you are considering to be funded. You have to balance between, uh, uh, say, if you are the coordinator of this of this project, of you have to balance between yourself as coordinator, your ideas, your wishes, your uh, mindset, and those of your partners, because each partner needs to be totally convinced that the project is also their project. So this idea of the ownership of the project is absolutely important. And that is uh, nurtured already at the stage of uh, of application of uh, at the conception stage of the uh, of the project because you involve all partners 
um, maybe writing the application is one man's exercise, but you need to consult and you need to be sure that everyone agrees that yes, these are the activities that we are going to carry out together. There is something in for me and, 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 and it is relevant for my organization. So everyone would be happy. So this balancing exercise is something that I think exactly gives a, a, a visual representation of what European projects are, at least for me. This is something that I would like you to note down and to remember always, because this is the key also to, um, to writing applications and to thinking, uh, say, in, in, in European uh, terms. Europe does not fund projects, but it finances its policies through projects. What does it mean? It means that you might have the most wonderful the brightest idea, but if this idea does not link to, does not relate to European policies, it's useless. So Europe sets its policies. Uh, there are lots of policy documents. And in fact, uh, those of you taking part in the workshops have received already some of them to quickly read them and, and, and just <coughs> get familiar with the priorities, with the ideas, and, and, and with the jargon also, uh, which is not only always friendly, but you, you get used. Uh, so those policies are spelled out by the European Union in their policy documents. And what Europe is doing, Europe is looking for projects that uh, help uh, make those policies uh, concrete, uh, make them real. Uh, so very careful about, you know, the project idea that you're thinking of, that you want to develop, because it really has to be in line with those policies. Some of these policies, just very quickly, also because uh, we will look at them more closely this afternoon. This is uh, ev normally every 10 years, the, the EU issues a new strategy. This was the previous EU strategy 2020, just to mention it, uh, which, um, which, uh, um, which underlined uh, or defined uh, three main priority areas, smart growth, uh, sustainable development and inclusive growth. And this is just a basic document. All other policy documents of the EU refer to this uh, fundamental, say, strategy. Now we have, and I'm just uh, showing you the, um, the link or the website address where you can find more information. Now you have these uh, priorities. Uh, for 2019-2024 uh, that are um, a Green Deal, of course, uh, fundamental, the, the climate control, uh, the environment, climate change. So this is a very important priority for the EU. Also, uh, the digital, so uh, contributing to the digital transformation, uh, actually making the digital transformation possible. An economy that works for people. So again, the idea of concentrating on people's well-being, um, combating poverty. Again, a stronger Europe in the world, which uh, and and also the, the 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 next two. So promoting the European way of life and the new push for European democracy. They all uh, refer to um, also not only but also to the values that that Europe. Uh, holds true and wants to disseminate uh, in the world. Um, other uh, reference documents are the new agenda for culture, which was um, issued in 2018. The previous agenda for culture um, lasted 10 years. So this one will possibly also have the same uh, life cycle, maybe 10 years or maybe less. But anyway, it is absolutely current now. This agenda for culture uh, identifies uh, these main areas, uh, the social dimension, um, so the importance of uh, looking at cultural diversity, social cohesion, well-being, the economic dimension, uh, 
supporting creativity in education and innovation, but also looking at elements to support the jobs and growth. The external dimension, so the, the role of the EU in uh, cultural diplomacy, how culture can be used to um, create uh, um, collaborations uh, with, with other countries. Uh, in general, so these two uh, are cross-cutting issues, protecting and valorizing cultural heritage, and again, the digital, the digital for culture, the digital dimension which has become and is so important. The priorities of the new agenda for cultural, social, and economic, and uh, the, the, the priorities of the new agenda for culture in its social, economic, and external dimension are these. And I just thought I would um, uh, mention them because these are the priorities that you will find pretty much in all the uh, calls and, and in other policy documents, uh, mobility of artists and cultural professionals, also mobility of artworks, social inclusion, and the dialogue with the creative sector, the connection of culture with health and well-being, but also with education. And, and, and in, in this case, um, the uh, new agenda of culture uh, specifically made reference to the uh, collaboration with the Western Balkans, Eastern partnerships, African Caribbean Pacific countries, and, and, and the launch of uh, European houses of culture in partner countries. Uh, so uh, more, uh, say, priorities, I think that we can uh, skip these. Uh, Looking at, uh, say, th these are really, this is a, a, a work plan. So this is something much more concrete and with a shorter lifespan. This is the um, work plan for culture 2019-2022, which uh, names these priorities. And these are areas where the European Union intends to work itself. Um, in the first place, uh, via the OMC groups, open method of coordination, uh, meetings of member states um, through the Voices of Culture uh, measure, which brings together also uh, players from the uh, civic society. These are the, so these are the topics. Sustainability in cultural heritage, cohesion and well-being, an ecosystem supporting artists, cultural and creative professionals, and European content, gender equality, and international cultural relations. So let's come to a very important uh, part of the, uh, of the toolkit and, and of our work if we want to engage in European funded projects. Where is the funding? Where do we look for the funding? Which programs fund culture? And in particular, which programs fund cultural heritage and museums? And can we find, identify, and look at some uh, EU funded projects in the museum sector that, that were previously funded? So to get a bit of an inspiration. So from this year, uh, 2021, you know, I didn't mention, but uh, the European programming mechanism uh, goes uh, seven years to seven years. It's a seven year uh, programming. So every seven years, the, um, the EU programs are slightly changed. Maybe the name changes, maybe the content changes, maybe the funding strands are different. So now we are at the beginning of a new funding program. Uh, period, say, which is 2021-2027. And uh, this is something new that was launched uh, in 2021. It is the portal, the funding and tender uh, portal. So if you enter this uh, portal, you will find right here um, a list of EU programs. So you click on them and you get more information. So this is a sort of like a one entry point to all the funding opportunities. Um, when, uh, when this was launched in May, 2021, there was also a webinar that uh, explained to everyone interested how to use the funding portal. And this webinar is still online. So if you're interested, if you want, you can go uh, to it and, and listen to, to this presentation. 
um, in the funding portal, you are uh, you are taken, say, hand in hand to go through the five steps to participate. Finding an opportunity, which is basically funding a, a call, funding a, a program that that can fund your uh, your project idea. Finding partners. There is also a possibility, I mean, there is an area where uh, there is uh, partner search is possible or partners who are interested in a specific call can, you know, put their details. And that is sort of like a meeting point. There are also other, um, other um, partner search uh, areas or, or, or websites and in the toolkit, um, there, there are links to a couple of them. So for finding partners, but it is, my advice is always to have at least uh, a few partners that you already know. Uh, then maybe you can find a partner online, but the best thing, the partners need to be tested. Uh, good partnership starts with trust, with knowing each other. So um, it is much better to, to work on this uh, networking exercise at the very beginning to find the partners and to have also personal contact. Then you have to create an account. So this is, has to be done online. All the details of your organization have to be uh, uploaded. Also some documents, your statutes, uh, etc. Uh, when you register and then the very last step is that of submitting your proposal or offer. Uh, and it says proposal or offer because there are two say, ch different channels of funding. One is grants uh, and, and, and we are con uh, concentrating on this. And the other, uh, the, other are, uh, the other one is call for tender. So one is calls for proposal, the other one are calls for tenders. Uh, calls for tenders are those calls where the EU needs a service or needs to buy uh, 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 goods or services or work in exchange of uh, money. Uh, so it is, uh, uh, <clears throat> I mean, it, it puts out its, its call and you maybe just as an individual organization reply if you have all the characteristics to do so. But we are interested in the calls for proposals and this is where the cooperation uh, projects belong. Uh, so, and, and in this case, uh, the EU does not give you money to, it, it sure gives you money to do something that you have detailed in your project application, but it gives you a grant. And in fact, it, it uh, in most cases doesn't give you the 100% of the, of the funding, it gives you a percentage, which can be 50, 75, 80, depending, and then you have to provide the rest and the rest can be provided through uh, work of people in your organization. So it does not necessarily mean to be monetary, but it needs to be, um, to, to, to be there and to be showing in the budget. So we are concentrating on calls for proposals and on EU grants. Let's look at some of these programs. Uh, and I start from Horizon Europe, uh, which is the, um, the program for uh, research, innovation, um, and uh, it was previously called Horizon 2020, and uh, previously also uh, it was referred to as the framework program. This funds research in every field, and you will see here um, that it also funds uh, science, uh, industry, um, and, and um, for the first time in, um, in this funding uh, period, it also uh, refers and funds more uh, significantly culture and the creative industry. You see, they, they, the program is organized in three pillars, uh, excellent science, innovative Europe, but then pillar two also includes cultural creativity and inclusive society. And this is where the uh, calls for uh, cultural heritage and museums are to be found. Then we have Erasmus Plus. Well, I'm sure that you are familiar with Erasmus Plus um, relating to university and university exchanges. Um, I'm going on Erasmus, yes. But Erasmus Plus funds much more 
Um, it also used to be called Erasmus, now it is called Erasmus Plus. Um, it supports uh, education, training, youth and sports, but also at different levels, not only at university level, but in general in education and, and also for museums. And also for museums when it comes to uh, cooperation projects, because uh, funding can be um, provided for learning mobility for individuals, um, but also for cooperation projects uh, and specifically for strategic partnerships. That's this cooperation uh, key A2 is where many of the um, of the museum cooperation projects belong or fall into, especially if they are focused on education or training or exchanging um, practices. Uh, and in fact, uh, if uh, uh, museum had not been funded by Creative Europe, it could have uh, been funded by Erasmus Plus. But from what I understand, for the time being in Georgia, Erasmus Plus funds um, university exchanges, if I'm correct. So, but maybe in the future, if these uh, funding uh, strands open up, they will be ideal for uh, small cooperation projects to exchange practices, to go and see how other countries are working and, and so for education and training and capacity building. And then there's also the sector skills alliances that these are more uh, ambitious um, and richer also funding uh, strands of the Erasmus Plus uh, program. I will mention one project which uh, is currently funded uh, by, uh, by this strand. I, in fact, I've already mentioned it, which is the, the charter project, but we will come back to it. And, and this is very much about um, filling the gaps in specific sectors. Uh, and, and cultural heritage was considered as one of these area uh, in, in, in the funding program that just ended. And so this uh, gave the possibility to a project like Charter to, to happen. And then support for policy reforms, but that is uh, beyond our scope, I think. And then we have the Creative Europe program, which is now called the new Creative Europe program because it's 2021, 2027. And uh, Creative Europe uh, funds not only uh, culture and the creative sectors, but also the audiovisual. So there are two uh, sub programs, one is culture and one is media. And the cultural sub program is designed to safeguard and promote cultural and linguistic diversity and to strengthen the competitiveness of the cultural and creative sectors. Um, we will look more uh, closely to the priorities of the program uh, this afternoon, uh, but just to mention that, you know, transnational mobility, uh, so mobility of cultural uh, operators, but also of artworks, uh, capacity building uh, are priorities, and uh, also audience development. Uh, is a priority. It's been a very, very strong priority in the previous funding program, but still is. So the public, the audience at the center of it all. Um, the cultural sub program has four funding strands. European cooperation projects. This is, for instance, what has funded the museum. Uh, European platforms, European networks. So NEMO is funded by uh, Creative Europe through this network and literally translations. And then there is another very important uh, player that should not be overlooked, and that is the European Education and Cultural Executive Agency, called EACEA, uh, which is, so to say, the operational arm of, uh, of the uh, European uh, Commission when it comes to um, dealing with Creative Europe and Erasmus Plus and other uh, programs. So the executive, executive agency is indeed the one that uh, publishes the calls uh, that you um, submit your application to. It is talking about Creative Europe now specifically, uh, that you submit your reports to if you're funded and your project officer when anything needs to be discussed 
for your uh, project or modified um, is a project officer uh, working in the so-called EACEA, the European Education and Culture Executive Agency. So now we have sort of looked at funding possibilities. We have looked at ourselves as an organization, what are our needs, what are our bright ideas. We have looked at the network and we have identified partners. We are coming to the point of writing our application, writing the proposal. I'm sorry, this is a bit blurred, but you find it in the, um, in the toolkit and you can read it more clearly. So you start from studying the context from which the project stems. You identify the target groups and the other stakeholders in your, uh, in your project the potential partners, so your consortium partners, and, and then you start detailing the project activities, the objectives, first of all, of the project, what are the objectives, and project activities and the outputs, so what are you going to deliver at the end of the project, but also not only at the end, in the different phases of the project, you draw uh, uh, an initial uh, risk and management plan and you build a work plan. All of this is, of course, detailed in the toolkit with all the indications and examples on how to do it. But just coming using a very concrete example, when you uh, develop a project, it's pretty much like, or, or a project plan, let's say, uh, pretty much like uh, building a house. You first of all start from the design, so you think the concept, the idea, and then you move to the procurement. Uh, you have to take care of all the electrical, the plumbing, all the components of your house, the construction, the inspections, and then finally the turnover, walking through the built house, and closing the project. Uh, so this is what is meant by a work plan. And, um, and here again, not very uh, legible uh, on your screen, but much more legible in the toolkit. There is an example of what a work plan should be like, that you have activities. You have to think when you uh, plan a project, when you, especially when you try to put it on paper, you should think in a structured way. You should think logically. The application form helps you to do so because they ask, it asks very specific questions that help you think in a, in a structured way. But your mindset should be very logical, very structured. So uh, what are the activities? What comes first? What comes next? What are the outputs? What are the milestones? So those very important moments in the project execution that mark a, a line, say a major conference or a publication or something that is very relevant. And especially what are the connections between all the activities? What comes first and what comes next? And what is the output of one activities of one activity that is indispensable to carry out the following activity. So all this connection, all this linking, all this together. And when you have done so, because I'm not going into the details of this, uh, which you can again find in the toolkit and that we will of course deal with in the workshop, at the end, you have produced a proposal which needs to be coherent, so which needs to be uh, showing a leading thread throughout. Uh, so even if you write, even if different people write the application, it's important that uh, you know, someone has an overview uh, to, to make sure that everything uh, makes sense that the reader, because you will have uh, an evaluator reading your application that he or she can understand. And that also that goes down to the minimal details like, using the same expression for the same thing. Sometimes maybe uh, we use different names for the same thing. Uh, no, it has to be consistent uh, because that helps absolutely the, the, the reader to, to, to understand uh, what you are proposing. It has to be clear, uh, it has to be simple, uh, and don't forget that the evaluator uh, does not necessarily uh, understand very much uh, 
um, your sector. Uh, because uh, for Creative Europe, for instance, which covers also the performing arts, uh, maybe the evaluator comes from, uh, from a theater background. Of course, he or she is an experienced person in evaluating European proposals, but may have, may, may not have a, 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 a a very detailed understanding of museums. So it is important to be simple, that everyone understands what you're, what you're writing, also if not an expert. You have to be explicit, so everything that you relate, uh, that you refer to has to be there. You don't have to assume the previous knowledge of the reader, not taking anything for granted. It has to be evidence-based, uh, so you have to, again, be logical, right? You have to show that what you are proposing as the reason for being. Uh, it has to be rigorous in the planning, again, structural, uh, logical. Uh, you have to identify activities. The, 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 the effort that uh, a EU funded uh, proposal requires is that of thinking forward, thinking ahead. You're sort of like uh, um, having to imagine how an activity, a project in this case, will unfold uh, in two or three or maybe four years. So it needs a lot of an exercise of forward planning and forward thinking. There has to be concrete, the outputs, so the, what are, they're also called in the EU jargon deliverables, have to be visible and tangible. And uh, the indicators to show that you have reached those that you have in fact delivered those outputs that you have reached those objectives have to use um, quantifiable and, and again, um, clear and tangible indicators. Has to be realistic, everything has to be achievable, innovative, because you will be asked to be innovative in a way, and cost effective, showing that the money that you have asked for is adequate for what you're proposing to do. So you have uh, uh, an efficient uh, use of the, um, of the financial resources. So now we come maybe to the lighter and uh, more fun part of looking through some of the EU funded projects. Uh, you will find some of them also listed in the toolkit uh, with links to go and look through, also look through the website because the website is an interesting uh, way of becoming familiar with, with projects. Um, some of them are, are really rich and really give you also an insight into how they planned the project. Uh, the work packages, uh, which are in fact work packages, are um, uh, units of, of different activities. Uh, their outputs, what they will be producing, they also publish the outputs. So you will find reports. So it's worth going through them. I'm just mentioning some of them uh, to, to show you how the different EU programs uh, fund the different things. This is not so recent, uh, but it is a, a project funded by the, in fact, it's called the seventh framework program, Horizon 2020, uh, the MELA project about uh, migration uh, and museums. Um, as I said, the uh, now called Horizon Europe, previously the framework program, uh, funds research. So the, the, this is a very uh, much research oriented project, which produced a huge number of documents, of reports, and you find them all on, on the website. Why am I mentioning this? Because this is not ideally the, um, say, funding uh, uh, framework where to start, especially if you are a small organization. These, mo the majority of these uh, Horizon Europe uh, projects are funded by, um, are led uh, by universities. So it is very much a research focus. And I'm not saying only addressed to universities and research centers, but mostly undertaken by those actors because these are big projects, sort of like million of euros uh, and, and very uh, ambitious and, and very engaging. So large museums take part uh, and, and uh, but mm, recently they have put in place some mechanisms to also involve smaller museums as sort of like uh, uh, say uh, uh, um, 
not primary but secondary beneficiaries of the funding. Uh, this is uh, uh, the, the first one was a uh, past project. This is a, a current project called Reinherit. Uh, and um, Reinherit is also funded by uh, Horizon. Um, it uh, wants to develop a, a, a cultural heritage ecosystem, bringing together museums, heritage sites, policy makers, professionals, communities, and provide uh, uh, and create a digital hub and provide uh, a digital platform for everyone to download and to use tools. So this is something that you might want to also keep in mind for the future. It started, uh, I think one year ago, so it's still ongoing. Uh, this other um, Horizon uh, funded project in Beaches, empowering the cultural and creative industries and policymakers to fully understand the social and economic impact of digitization and innovate the reuse of cultural assets. So um, this is a project that wants to um, use the possibility of uh, um, or, or enhance the possibility of reusing uh, digital, um, digital materials and also provide tools to measure um, and advance the impact of cultural heritage in Europe. So it is very much on the side of policy making. Again, very ambitious, uh, involving big partners. And then I'm mentioning some of the, of the projects that were funded by the lifelong learning program, which is now called Erasmus Plus. Uh, these are, uh, this is one of the projects that, that I was also personally involved in and that I led. Um, as I said, Erasmus uh, is very much on uh, focus on education, training, etc. And this project, uh, which dates 23, 25, um, 2000 and, uh, and, uh, 3, 2005, 2007, um, aimed to design and deliver uh, training in didactic materials to support museum educators to work with adults. So this, um, it was very much focused on, on providing a practical support to museum educators. And indeed, this publication, the European Handbook, uh, Lifelong Learning in Museums, uh, is, is still quite uh, important, considered a, a, an important, uh, you see, this is the sustainability of a project. This was, uh, I don't remember if it was published in 2005, I probably 2007 published. So the project was 2005, 2007. So this is the legacy, say, of a European funded project, a European handbook that's been translated into many languages and uh, that is still used by museum professionals. Another one that I uh, conceived, designed and coordinated, funded by by Erasmus, well, Erasmus Plus at the time called uh, Lifelong Learning was mapped for ID uh, to develop the potential and practice of museums as places of intercultural dialogue. And, and this was again um, an exchange of practices, a training, the production of a, of a handbook. I'm going quickly because I see that we are uh, coming close to the end of our uh, webinar and I would like to, to leave uh, room for questions. This is more recent, uh, Creating Museum um, and the Making Museum, which brought together uh, museums and the uh, community of makers of digital creatives, also funded by Erasmus. Uh, by Erasmus Plus. At the time it was called Erasmus Plus. And this is uh, also a recent one which just closed, I think, uh, to um, bring together museums to encourage their collaboration with vocational education and training institutions to develop joint educational programs. It's much more natural for museums to address uh, school groups uh, like primary, secondary, and maybe not less, uh, maybe less so to engage vocational education and training schools. So this project uh, wanted to do exactly that. And the charter, which I mentioned, also funded by the um, Erasmus Plus, but sector skills alliances um, funding strand uh, has a very ambitious uh, 
aim in the next uh, four years, actually it started at the beginning of 2021 and will end at the end of 24. Um, it wants to develop a sector skill alliance for cultural heritage. So in other words, first of all, to establish cultural heritage as a sector in say European statistics. So thereby giving value to museum and cultural heritage professionals so that they are recognized so that their presence and the description of the profiles and the occupational profiles in, uh, in um, European statistics, so that the presence of those profiles also encourages mobility uh, between countries and also wants to identify the, uh, the training gaps. Uh, what are the drivers of change now in the, in the cultural heritage sector nowadays and in the future? And how can we address those gaps and, and, and develop training programs, training and educational programs, so university level vocational education and training level to make sure that the professions are up to what society is looking for nowadays. A couple of uh, Creative Europe uh, funded uh, projects, this is called SWITCH, Sharing a World of Inclusion, Creativity and Heritage. Uh, this brought together the most important ethnographic museums in Europe to think of ways uh, to um, think of practices and policies and, and programs for the decolonization of museums. So in other words, to make these ethnographic uh, museums that uh, draw from a colonial past uh, more uh, contemporary and also support them in uh, describing the history of the collections and make it more relevant for citizens um, in Europe and also from the countries where, uh, for the countries where the, uh, where the collections came from. And also this uh, project, Adeste Plus, this was a long, uh, say, um, uh, progression of Adeste projects. Um, Adeste is about uh, audience development. Uh, audience development uh, was, especially in the previous Creative Europe funding strand, a sort of like a, uh, a cross-cutting priority. It should be in every project and was also a priority in itself. And um, so some, uh, some uh, partners got together and over the years worked uh, to develop tools and ideas to support cultural uh, and cultural heritage organizations to really become relevant for their public and so to improve audience development. This was the uh, very final event which took place a few days ago, final conference of this Adeste project. So, EU funded projects, what's in for you? I think there is a lot a lot of ideas, a lot, even if you just go through the uh, previously funded project. But if you want to engage, my, um, my uh, suggestion is that of starting small. So start as a minor partner uh, in, a, in a project so that you can observe how things go. Uh, start maybe as a member of, of a network organization, again, of a member of the Georgian Museum uh, Association to see how things happen, uh, to learn because the learning component is very important and also to uh, take advantage, if possible, of the mobility of exchanging with other, uh, with other uh, organizations and partners from different countries. So I would just like to end with some of the quotes, which are also in the, in the toolkit, of course. Um, International cooperation will open doors and teach you things you didn't even anticipate, says Pirio Amari. This will give you tremendous amounts of added value for your efforts, and the efforts are considerable. You ask Lana, there's a lot of work, it's very demanding, but you get a lot out of it. And here's Lana herself. The collaboration with European partners create valuable cultural products in terms of development and change management in the emerging countries and reinforces a sense of belonging to a common European space. This is one of the main and most important effects that the EU wants to achieve 
with its funding program. And then finally, and I think this is very nice, from the director of the National Museum of Contemporary History of Slovenia, we started as colleagues, then we became friends. And I think this is true also for me with all the different uh, connections I have established over the year that I met colleagues who over the years became friends. So this is all from me. And with this, I uh, stop sharing. So I can see you. I'd like to ask, please. Ah, uh, yes, please. Mm -hmm. uh, can there be found any specific difference governmental and non-governmental institutions while dealing with the funding opportunities? Yeah, yes. um, I think in this, you, you, you have been able to have a project led by Georgia funded. And that was a major achievement, really. But I would say uh, the, first, um, the first step would also to be maybe a partner in a project led by another country, talking about Creative Europe. And then I see, and I really wish that Erasmus Plus uh, could become also a funding. I understand correctly, Lana, that, uh, that for the time being, it is only uh, open for universities. Erasmus Plus. But if, yeah. Erasmus, if Erasmus Plus uh, is uh, open or becomes open also for, uh, for cooperation projects, uh, for organizations other than, uh, uh, than universities, then that is the ideal uh, environment where to start. First of all, because uh, Erasmus Plus is now these cooperation projects are funded by, uh, are, the applications are submitted at national level. So if Georgia, say, if a Georgian organization is, um, is, is a leader, is the lead partner in, in the project, has to submit the application to the Georgian uh, Erasmus, Erasmus Plus agency, which brings with it all the uh, facilitations of speaking the same language, etc. So much easier. And then also the format of these projects is much more manageable because they can be small projects where the budget is very easy to construct because it's made of unit costs. So you are given so much for every month. So it's, it's easy to put together a budget. But I'm just talking of the future now. So you want to know now the present, mm -hmm. uh, dealing with uh, Creative Europe only. I would say, um, Creative Europe uh, allows, uh, gives the possibility of working on small, medium or large scale projects. So definitely one has to think of small uh, scale projects where you have uh, at least three uh, partner countries, but at least, but can also be the maximum. So with three, it is much more manageable. And um, so I think that it is just a matter of getting in, get, get going, and maybe finding the opportunities that other, um, that other countries or other partners, other organizations have in mind and proposing yourself as a partner. Being a partner is always a, a nice situation because you see exactly. how they, they all, right, being you a coordinator, you can tell. Uh, yes. So, so uh, you, you can see how the project unfolds. You learn an awful lot. You also learn from mistakes. My biggest learning was from other people's mistake. When I started working on European mm -hmm. projects, first project I, I, I was part of uh, as a partner, it was managed in a terrible way. I learned a lot because you learn how to do things and also how not to do things. So, uh, so yeah, exactly. being a partner in a project led by another country, uh, EU member state, for instance. Uh, so how do you achieve that? You have to network. You yeah. have to look around and, 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 and establish a connection which can be also uh, focused on your discipline. I don't know where you work or what, but can be, you know, focused on the, um, I don't know. I, yeah, I uh, Maya is from the library museum, um, the lady who asked this question. Yes, that is also, that is also, of course, mm -hmm. there is uh, there, this um, initiative, initiative, I don't know, it's called Library 2030. Mm -hmm. It's uh, operating at European level. Libraries do an enormous, no, I, I have 
contacts also with libraries if you're interested. I mean, just a matter of getting uh, about. You have, yeah. and now online one can get about pretty much uh, to over to destinations when where uh, one would normally not go. Yes. So I'm sorry, I'm, I'm moving to the, let's see. Yeah, there is a question uh, which Tatia has already put in the chat. Can there be found any specific differences for governmental and non-governmental organizations while dealing and with the EU funding? Uh, an organization does not need to be, to, to be governmental necessarily. It can be or can also not be. This is not the distinction for the EU. Um, what is important, especially if, uh, if uh, an organization is coordinator, is the financial and operational capacity, because the EU is giving funds to organizations that are, uh, you know, uh, reliable, uh, solid, so to say. So it doesn't make, of course, no, that, that is a difference. If you are a governmental organization, or if you are a public organization, also a regional organization, then in the eyes of the EU, you look more reliable because you're not going to go bankrupt. Because of course, they are interested, they are investing money uh, and, and they want to, you know, that money to be spent properly and not to get lost or to disappear at a certain point. So uh, they, they have, of course, they put all the uh, necessary uh, financial guarantees in place, but I also experienced working for a regional organization in some ways uh, when we, we didn't have to, to have a bank guarantee, for instance, uh, when, when applying for European funding, because it was taken for granted that being a regional organization, we would be reliable and economically. So that, that is the only difference, really. But in terms of who can participate and who cannot, there are not. NGOs can also be, uh, be, be partners or, or maybe even coordinators. Yeah, on our examples, yes, we are the non-governmental organization. But uh, as for the bank issues, Margarita knows that we had this we had and still I think we have this issue uh, but um, it was just very fortunate that Creative Europe Georgia uh, which is under the Ministry of Culture they created the match funding uh, scheme for this uh, um, award uh, awarded project so it really helped and thanks to them for this. That is great. Yeah. Also in the toolkit I mentioned it but I don't I, I was not sure uh, because I, I um, I included the information after talking with the uh, Creative Europe Bulgarian uh, desk, uh, uh, which had established this scheme also uh, a long time ago. And I know that some countries had followed uh, this example, but I was not sure about Georgia. That is uh, very helpful because say, if you win uh, a Creative Europe project, you know that this, I mentioned the grant is not a hundred percent, then that difference is is made up by 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 creating Europe so that's yeah yeah if there is no question uh we can conclude this webinar and uh, thank you very much first of all margarita and thank you the participants for attending this webinar i am really i really hope that it was really helpful for you and we recorded the webinar in two languages in both languages georgian and english and we will publish it uh, publish it in, on our YouTube channel, of course, and it will be accessible uh, for everyone. Thank you very much. Thank and you very much. It was a pleasure. It and was I pleasure. hope to come thank to Belize sometime. Yeah, in the it future. would be great, really. But thank you very much. Yeah. Bye bye. Bye bye, bye, -bye everyone. <laughs>